Good evening. I know we're a little light today. I guess the, the cold weather kept people home. But uh, today, though, we're going to heat things up a bit because we're going to get it so hot that we're going to want to get out of sin. We're going to want to get out of Babylon. And so today, as we get out, we will open with our first hymn, hymn 705, The Man is Ever Blessed, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Please stand as we open our worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We join together in saying Psalm 102 responsively. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry for let me let my cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear for my days vanish like smoke, my bones burn like glowing embers. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. Because of my loud groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. I am like a desert owl, like an owl among the ruins. I lie awake. I become like a bird alone on a roof. My days are like the evening shadows. I wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, sit in throne forever. Your renown endures through all generations. You will arise and have compassion on Zion, for it is time to show f favor to her. The anointed time has come. For the Lord will rebuild Zion and appear in his glory. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. He will not despise their plea. Father, you invite us to come up to your loving embrace. Doing so, we confess our sins, make known our sins of pride, and renounce all ungodly thoughts, words, and actions. Upon this, your confession. I announce the amazing and transforming grace of God to all of you. Christ's blood was shed. His tomb is empty. His return is certain. And you are eternally forgiven. Therefore, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The name of the Lord will be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. 
when the people assemble to worship the Lord. You may remain standing as we sing hymn 705, verses 1, 3, and 6. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you provided the gift of your Son, who suffered and died to cleanse us from our iniquities. As our atoning sacrifice and Passover lamb, his blood forgives us and frees us from all sin. Hear us as we give you thanks and praise for this wonderful salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we as for the readings. So instead of having the kids come up, we're just going to talk to you right here, okay? And you guys can participate too, because you're all God's children, right? Right. So I've got a question for you guys, okay? Have you ever heard a fire alarm? Yes. Yes. Done yes. Oh, okay. Bing, 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 bing. It goes bing, 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 bing. Yeah. Is is it? I was about to ask. Is it quiet or is it loud? It's super loud. Super loud. Now, why why would it be so loud? So let people know that there's a fire and they need to get out really quick. They need to get out. Like teachers that don't have really good hearing, um, it helps them when it's louder. Oh, yeah? You think it's because the teachers can't hear real well. Okay. Well, that's true in the nursing home. What? That's true in the 
nursing home when I worked there. Yeah, the nursing home was extra loud too? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, what would happen if a fire started up? What would happen with that fire alarm? It would start going. Okay, okay. Now, what would happen to the people when that fire alarm went off? They would be scared and would go and see what kind of quick as possible. Or sort of line up and then evacuate the building. Yeah, you would get out, right? Yeah. So here's another question What would happen to the people, or what would they do? if the fire alarm never went off, but there was a fire. Wait, wait, stop! They could possibly die, or if there was a fire alarm there, and they started to stop. It would be they, bad, wouldn't it? They would probably pull it, and people would have to start evacuating. Yeah, it, that could be really bad. Like, it, people could die, right? That would be not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Do you know, in our Bible reading today, the prophet Isaiah, well, God, through the prophet Isaiah, said, get out. He was talking to the people of Israel, and he said, get out of Babylon. It's on fire. It's dangerous. You need to leave. He was the alarm. He was the alarm. Very good. He was the alarm, and he wanted God's people to get out because God knew that they were on fire in sin, in the dangers of sin. And so in our reading, God said, get out. And so what should we do when we hear that there's sin around us? Get out. Get yeah. out of it. Exactly. And how and how do we get out of sin? Jesus. With Jesus. With Jesus. Jesus. Exactly. Jesus is the one who gets us out, isn't he? Because when we try running around in all the smoke, we get confused. We don't know what's going on. But Jesus guides us out. Yeah. He guides us out and he forgives us and makes it all new again. Let's fold our hands. Ready? Repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you, thank you for, getting us out for getting us out of sin. Of sin. Help, us Help us to always listen to you, to always listen to you. Our, fire alarm. our fire alarm. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. We continue now with our next song.
Peter, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please stand on the gospel reading. Our gospel reading is from St. Matthew, chapter 10, verses 26 through 33. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. By even the hairs of, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is, in who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We now join together in confessing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. When someone asks what you believe, you can respond by saying... I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we sing hymn 431, Not All the Blood of Beast. <laughs>
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I just flipped everything. <laughs> Two urgent words are spoken to people in the following situations. Let's see if you can guess what they are. Three children are stuck inside a burning building. A family of five is stuck in a minivan plunging into a river. A talented young man is stuck in a dead-end job. Now, what would you say in two words to those people? Get out. Exactly. Now, once when I was uh, teaching Air Force ROTC, uh, we were teaching the cadets specifically. I'm sorry. I was teaching the cadets about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how to apply that to motivational leadership theories. And so I demonstrated the bottom tier of Maslow's motivational hierarchy, which is the basic need of human beings for survival. And I did this by running up the stairs to the cadet classroom and yelling, there's a fire, everyone get out! As the waiting cadets processed, I then turned around and ran down the stairs and got myself out. Slowly at first, they started getting up and moving, and then more surely, they started heading down the stairs. The bewildered cadets eventually got to the bottom of the stairs, and I stopped them, and so then we returned back to the classroom to discuss what motivated them to get out. How, though, even an unlikely and remote risk to their basic need for survival, they were still motivated to listen. In August 587 B.C., Israel, Israel's world caved in. The temple was demolished and burnt. The monarchy lay in ruins. The land became a wasteland. And all hope for survival was dismantled and destroyed. After that, a massive aftershock, if you would, if you will, brought them even further, brought them even further wreckage and ruin. As they traveled 700 miles from home, and Israel's exile became that they were trapped in a basement under a burning building called Babylon. The prophet Isaiah's summons is very singular in this instance. Get out, he tells them. Easier said than done, though, because with every passing year, the Babylonian god Marduk seemed more and more powerful, while Israel's god seemed almost incidental. Slowly but surely, the exiles began to accommodate themselves to their new surroundings. After all, they couldn't even see the flames. Instead, the heat, of the, Bab uh, the heat of Babylon became to them a luxurious hot tub to soothe their weary feet after a long exile. In fact, the economic documents unearthed in a find in Tel El Marasu on the Tigris River showed that the blending of or the blending in with Babylon brought a stunning financial success. And so living comfortably in a place of destruction and death became their new way of life. It was that whole boiling frog scenario. And although I've never tried this myself, I've always been told that if you place a frog in a pot of hot water, it will immediately jump out. But if it's placed in a pot of lukewarm water and then gradually heated up, it won't get out. Instead, it will slowly die. The exiles are calling their Babylonian basement the new 
normal. They are in hot water, and if they don't get out, they will soon die. Isaiah's charge, therefore, is to do everything possible to awaken Israel out of this spiritual slumber and get them out of Babylon. And so he announces that Yahweh will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations. Isaiah 52 verse 10. His glory will be revealed and all flesh will see it together. 40 verse 5. Rest assured, Isaiah says, that those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. For a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. 42 verse 3. And in 51 verse 17, and then again in 52 verse 1, he cries, Wake! Awake! The climax of this preaching comes in our text for tonight. In chapter 48, verse 20, get out, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy. And Israel's response? Nothing. Nothing. They wouldn't leave. They or the lights of Babylon, the sounds of Babylon, the religion of Babylon coaxed them, at least most of them, into staying in Babylon. That's why throughout Isaiah 48, the prophet calls them stubborn and unyielding, headstrong, prone to idolatry, deaf, deceptive, and stubborn rebels from birth. All this because Israel refused to listen to the gospel of their salvation. Listen is the governing verb of the chapter. In fact, it appears in chapter 48 11 times. Can't you just imagine how the people would respond to the prophet? Isaiah... Haven't you heard? Babylon is the political, military, religious superpower of the day. This is the land of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Why should we go back to that little backwater Judah? Besides, it would be such a hassle. We'd have to liquidate our assets, pack our bags, pull up stakes just to live in a land that is devastated by famine and warfare. Get out of Babylon? Isaiah, have you lost your mind? This is kind of like a thirsty person dying for clean water, choosing to drink from a sewage pipe. Choosing sewage over a crisp mountain spring or a well. The exiles are unmoved by Isaiah's poetic claims of his alarming narratives, of his stunning doxologies. And so in a similar way, our bondage began with just one more drink, one more lie, one more fling, one more glance, but one more always leads to one more and then just one more. We know it. Yes, we can truly em empathize with Israel because we are seeing it daily in our lives. And then a massive earthquake hits and its aftershocks we find ourselves trapped in a basement called Babylon. What next? The boiling frog scenario unleashes its hypnotic power. Sure, being a, obsessed with things like pornography and money and gossip and food and people's approval or of a work place 
Well, that's a strange place to be in at first. It's crushing to be trapped beneath tons of hopes and shattered dreams. But in time, we become accustomed to living in destruction and death. With each passing day, it becomes easier to deny that I am stuck on stuff that kills and stills and destroys. We are in hot water. This is why God says, Go out from Babylon. Flee from Chaldea. Declare this with a shout of joy. It is in God's heart to call people out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called Abraham and Sarah to get out of Haran because it was the center of an idolic moon worship. He urged Lot and his family to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah because it was the center of sexual perversion. He called Israel to get out of Egypt because it was the epicenter of a society that brought about massive dehumanization. You see, at the core of Israel's narrative is the Lord's ongoing call for his people to get out of decay and decadence and death. And our response too often, it's nothing. We don't listen to the gospel of our salvation. Isaiah 30, verse 10 through 11 is a classic response to the prophetic call, to the prophetic call as Isaiah points out, speak to us smooth things, prophesy illusions, stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. But deep down, we're thirsty. Not for more of the same. We know it's like drinking salt water in a desert. It doesn't quench, it kills. No, we're thirsty for a clean conscience. A fresh start for a loving, tender hand to reach into our basement and get us out. And that's exactly what God says to Israel. Isaiah 40 through 55 is chock full of good news. Consider these words. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. 43 verse 25. Or I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. 44 verse 22. These great and precious promises are found and fulfilled and come to fruition in Isaiah's suffering servant. Jesus, our Lord. The one murdered for us. You know, in the classic gangster narratives when the head of the mob has ordered a hit, you know, a murder, someone inevitably says, it's not personal, it's just business. <laughs> but not so with the murder of Jesus. It was intensely personal. Judas Iscariot, Iscariot betrayed Jesus with a kiss. In his hour of need, his friends ran for cover. His countrymen clamored for his death. His very own father abandoned him. It was very personal. But it was also personal on another level. Jesus suffered and died for you. He bled for you. He sweated for you. He felt the nails and the thorns for you. And because of that, Jesus comes for you in your hour 
power of darkness and sin. He comes to rescue, release, and free you from guilt and shame and regret. And our response, we get out of Babylon. We flee Chaldea. We declare this with a shout of joy. Praise God. Christ died for me. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now worship God with our tithes and offering, and we will collect the offering as we sing verse 1 of hymn 563, and then the offering will be brought forward as we sing verse 6, in which we'll stand as well. according to how it's printed on page 6 of your bulletin. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you command your church Here are shouts of joy. O oh God, you give us this mandate and so we say to the world Lord God, with gladness and great delight we say the Lord has Hands were cut, blood was shed, and we are saved. All praise to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Boldly and confidently we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.
You may be seated as we sing verses 1, 2, and 5 of hymn 421, Jesus grant that balm and healing. So I didn't yell fire, get out, but uh, it's basically what we live in. It's a, it's a subtle burning, a subtle warming, a subtle temptation, and temptation after temptation after temptation should help us at least be more aware of God crying out to us, get out. Flee from sin. Flee from Babylon. Follow our Savior Christ. Amen. So you'll notice on the back of your bulletin, we do have listed the Holy Week services. And so um, that's going to be the, we have in this building at least, we'll have a lady prayer service and breakfast on Tuesday, March 26th at 7 a.m. And then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday will be at 7 p.m. I know we've been doing the 4.30 ones on the Wednesdays, but we're going to do 7 p.m. for Thursday and Friday of Holy Week. And then for Easter Sunday, we'll have our two services with the sunrise at 6.45, and then an Easter breakfast at 7.45, and then Easter worship Again, sorry, a second service at 9 a.m. and then an Easter egg hunt at 10.15. And so come for the first and stay to the last if you want. <laughs> It'll be a blessed holiday as we recognize and rejoice in our risen Savior. Any questions or comments for me or announcements? Sorry. 
We do have our potluck tonight in the fellowship hall, so join us afterwards. Um, myself and my family will be gone next Sunday. Pastor John Widmer from uh, Moab, Grace and Moab, will be preaching for us next Sunday. Uh, we'll be back, though, on Tuesday evening, so that I'll be doing the Wednesday service of next week as well. With that, let's get out. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.